People call them the flower children and the love generation, and they laugh at the hippies. And the hippies laugh at the people, for they know that the hippie movement is not flowers and love or beards and beads. The hippie movement is dope, drugs, LSD, marijuana, methamphetamines, all of these eventually. But to start with, it is often just glue, a blob of airplane cement in a paper bag, and it can start quite young. Her name is Debbie. She's been sniffing glue since she was 10. She is now 13. Debbie and her brother Chuck and their friends pool their allowances to rent this apartment in Dallas to hold glue parties. And their mother sits at home, knowing vaguely what her children are about with their glue parties, but only vaguely. These two seem to do nothing and have no feeling of responsibility. However, I don't understand it. It has only occurred within the last two or three years since the death of her father. party, another apartment. It too is a communal apartment, rented for glue sniffing by some 16, 17, and 18 year old boys in Dallas. This was an all day, all night party, glue and wine. They got very high. Concentrated inhalation of glue vapors can cause hallucination, disruption of motor functions, euphoria. It can also cause blindness, paralysis, severe impairment, even death, for it is poison. This they either do not know, do not believe, or do not care. They are moved to what seems under drugs to be the most profound and searching religious dialogue. A cliche becomes luminous insight, and babbling is engraved on stone. God is not there is nothing but drugs. God is not God is hot. God is hot. God is start. Not long after this party was held in Dallas, some of these young people would find their way to marijuana, to LSD, 
to the hippie hovels of the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. There as here, chasing hallucinations and finding agony. This is the agony of crashing. He has been very high and is crashing very hard. This is the physical and mental anguish of withdrawal from the poisonous effects of the glue vapors. His friends suggest that he sniff more glue and make it better. He does and makes it worse. He seeks the comfort of fresh air and finds the rain. There is an informed estimate that one million American teenagers use drugs. These scenes may be ugly, but they are not uncommon. Not flowers and love or beards and beads, but dope. That is how the hippie movement starts, and that is why it exists. Sniffing glue in an apartment in Dallas was the beginning for Donnie and Chuck and White Eyes, but it was only the beginning. A man came to their apartment offering them marijuana and LSD. They took it and wanted more. He said they should come with him to San Francisco. For San Francisco, he said, is where it's at. In San Francisco, when a few people gather on Hippie Hill, there is marijuana, pot, And when there is pot, people do gather. A girl moved amongst them distributing free samples of LSD, acid. The best known brand in San Francisco is called Owsley Acid, named after Augustus Owsley Stanley, an enterprising young man who does not like to have his picture taken, and it rarely is. But this is he, nicknamed the Acid King. Owsley Acid has helped make the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco the acid capital of the world. That is why Chuck and Donnie and White Eyes and their friends came here from Dallas. San Francisco is where LSD was first marketed, where it is most readily and cheaply available. Like the Amsterdam Diamond Market and the Chicago Grain Market, San Francisco is the world's acid market, where buyers and sellers of LSD meet. There are probably no more than five chemists illegally manufacturing it in the area, but they produce enough for 100,000 tabs of LSD each week. A sideline, San Francisco is estimated also to smoke a ton of marijuana each week. Donnie and Chuck and White Eyes told their parents in Dallas they were coming here to play in a band. They came for acid and pot. That is why thousands upon thousands come to live amid the poverty and trash of the hippie hovels of the Haight-Ashbury. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe pot. The hippie in the hate feels like an animal in the zoo. There's not much to do all day long, and there are all those tourists with all those cameras. They say the people, particularly the press, exploit them. 
In fact, they exploit the people, peddling their own vulgar journalism, their own psychedelic trinkets. Only by this, or by panhandling or dealing, can they buy the acid and pot that brought them here. This is what the tourist, gawking at the eccentrics, is subsidizing. There is an undefined sociological relationship between taking dope and protesting. Something stirs them to march, even when they can't think of anything to protest against. In the park of a bright afternoon, there is a hippie wedding. The preacher is a man called Teddy Bear. He is a dope dealer. LSD washed down with wine is the only sacrament. There are no vows. She will be his woman for as long as they feel like it. Frank, you take Kathy to be your woman, be your wife? Yeah. Be married before God and before the people. <laughs> All is love, sweet and tender, unbridled by the social inhibitions of the establishment, the straight world. Another couple wanders by, is moved by the spirit, and they decide they too should get married. And it all seems so typical of the hippie movement. But Teddy Bear here knows better. He told a reporter, there never were any flower children. It was the biggest fraud ever perpetrated on the American public, and it is your fault, you the mass media. This community, he said, is not based on love. This community is based on dope. Nicholas von Hoffmann, a reporter for the Washington Post, lived in the hate for three months and wrote one of the most incisive series on the hippie movement. He said, there are conservative and liberal hippies. There are hippies who hate the establishment and those who are indifferent to it. There are hippies who love money. There are hippies who love love. But if the word means anything, he wrote, it means a hippie either. Of the three boys we saw from Dallas, two were arrested on marijuana charges and given three years probation. The other was sent home as a runaway. The time comes a person feels he has to get away, to be alone. To love. To study. to take dope. This is the latest stage in the evolution of the hippie movement. The hippies are trying to get away. The world has been too much with them and they seek escape. So they go out to a cabin in the countryside and start a commune, a group of compatible hippies sharing their rice and beans and hepatitis and venereal disease. Disease is a nagging problem in these new hippie communes. Still, there are many of these communes growing up, particularly in the West. This one is in Northern California. It is called Ben Lomond. Here, Perhaps to the accompaniment of a visiting rock band, they can get away from the tourists and the reporters who badger them in San Francisco, from the rents and bills and cost of living in a big city, and from the police. They work the land with the ardor of neo-pioneers. They try to raise their own food. They try to be as self-sufficient as they can. For that way, what money they get, they don't have to use to buy meat. They can buy drugs. The drugs are illegal. The children, the second generation of hippies, are mostly illegitimate. 
A mother said she gave her 20-month-old baby LSD, and if the straight world doesn't like it, they don't care. Some of the straights come to their commune to see them, to gawk at them, or to buy marijuana from them. A lid of pot, five dollars. We said hippie communes are springing up all over. This curious clutch of geodesic domes is in southern Colorado. It's called Drop City. To drop, in hippie language, means to take LSD. And that is what they are doing here, again at the commune in Northern California, dropping acid, taking LSD. It is so much freer and it is so much easier out here. What will follow this dispersal of the hippie movement to the countryside is hard to predict. They may be, as they say, coming here to build the foundations for a new society in this nation, a drug society. Or they may be coming like the woolly mammoth to find their own extinction. Some hippies believe the greatest allies they have in spreading dope throughout this country are the mass media of this country. Every day the radio plays drug music, get yourself a little green, day tripper. And the teenagers get the message from these. They know that green is marijuana, a trip is a drug experience. They don't need Captain Midnight decoder rings to figure it out. In magazines they see psychedelic fashions inspired by drugs. On television, they see comedians lightly joking about taking pot and turning on. And even that straightest of all straights, Perry Como, innocently presents a psychedelic number which for six minutes looks like a coast-to-coast -coast drug hallucination. Whatever the motives of all this, the message teenagers get from it, they say, is that drugs are fun and that they are what's happening within people. Hippie leaders say, they cannot set the climate for a drug culture in this country by themselves. The mass media must help spread the word. And they believe that the mass media are doing it. <laughs> 